Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 30th of April. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 3rd of May 2021 with me, Michael Houston. It's been one of those weeks this week, um, quite choppy. Um, obviously, there are concerns about rising COVID cases in India um, and what's unfolding there is an absolute tragedy. Um, and I think that is limiting some of the upside in terms of European markets. We've certainly seen that play out in the DAX, which has really, I think, struggled for gains this week. On the other hand, we've seen the CAC cut on, make new 20-year highs. The FTSE 100 is trying to get back towards and above the 7,000 level. And we've seen a plethora of really decent earnings announcements from the US tech giants. But more than that, UK banks have, have also come out with some fairly decent numbers as well, as they've rotated um, some of their loan loss provisions back onto their balance sheets and thus boosting their profits. Um, we've seen the S&P 500 make new record highs this week. Same goes for the NASDAQ. But what we've also seen is US Treasury yields also start to edge back up as well. And I think that may well be manageable, um, assuming they don't move significantly above 1.8%. I think one of the key takeaways from this week's events and the Fed meeting is the fact that the Federal Reserve really did nix quite significantly all talk of a taper um, or any and or any type of reining back on its current levels of monetary accommodation or stimulus, whatever you want to call it. But Jay Powell, I think it was notable in his press conference um, how determined he was to play down expectations that the Federal Reserve was likely to um, even contemplate any sort of taper. On its monthly bond on, on its monthly bond buying program, um, in the short to medium term. However, the data might have other ideas, and certainly next week, as we look ahead to next week, non-farm payrolls and ADP payrolls and the ISM numbers could well play a part in maybe shifting that dynamic back towards um, slightly higher bond yields. If we if we look quite closely at uh, US 10-year treasuries, we can see that there does appear to be a fairly decent base in and around that 1.5% level. Um, but by the same token, what we're also seeing, if we move this, if we, if we can move this chart over like so, we can see that um, it is, they, are, they are starting to edge back up again. And I think that will be important in the overall scheme of things. Um, as we look ahead towards the next few weeks. The fact that US Treasury yields are starting to edge back up should be sustainable, should be containable in terms of equity markets as long as we don't accelerate any more than we have done since the beginning of the year. And I think that more than anything is what the Fed is concerned about. I don't think it's concerned so much about the fact that yields are going higher. It's really more concerned about the speed at which they're going higher. And at the moment, we do seem to have hit a bit of a short term peak. I think the bigger concern at the moment, and at the moment, it's not really a factor, is what two year yields are doing. And two year yields are still very, very flat. And I think while the short end of the curve has the Fed sitting on it and two year, two year borrowing costs remain where they are, I think ultimately we could well see um, we, we can we can probably expect to see equity markets continuing to remain resilient. Obviously, there are risks to the upside or the recovery story, um, whatever whatever you want to call it. And obviously, events in India are a very big concern, um, particularly if they start to spill out um, beyond um, India's borders. We've also seen increased restrictions in Japan. Turkey has gone into lockdown as well. So even though we're making good progress on the virus in the UK and also in the US. We've had European leaders talking about loosening restrictions um, next week. 
and potentially or next month rather sorry next month uh beginning of june france and italy trying to reopen before they've really got the virus under control that is a real i think that's a real concern going forward given that only two or three weeks ago we were really concerned about rising virus cases in france and now Emmanuel macron is talking about um, loosening restrictions on indoor hospitality and leisure in the middle of may i mean it just seems it just seems a little bit too soon given where they are um, in the um, vaccination story. So, what does that mean going forward as we come out of April? It's been a good month for equities in April, and of course, once you come to the end of April, you get the inevitable questions or the inevitable metaphors about sell in May and go away. Um, I just wish those sell in May and go away um, little um, sound bites would go away because they don't really have any basis in fact and they're not really practical um, in an era where fiscal policy has loosened quite substantially and while monetary policy remains loose ultimately the markets will go where the money is or money will go where the markets see or where, where, where people see that there's value. And we've seen blowout earnings from the likes of Apple, Amazon, and Facebook, and Alphabet this week. And we've seen really big gains in an awful lot of those stocks. I think the big question is, what effect will the current chip shortage have on earnings as we look ahead for the rest of the year? But more importantly, I think, you know, in terms of the data in the US and the UK, um, I think the bias really is very much to the upside. So I think as we look ahead to next week, there are concerns. China China data may be starting to slow down somewhat. So we'll be looking at the China trade numbers, which are due out on the 7th at the end of the week. We've obviously got the Bank of England rate meeting on Thursday on the 6th. We've got non-farm payrolls um, on the 7th as well. Join me to cover those numbers at 1 p.m. You can basically sign up for that um, on the CMC Markets website. Um, those are usually, while they're not particularly market moving events, I think what they can do is they can they give me an opportunity to talk about the markets in general, um, but but also give you a steer as to what um, policymakers might um, might be thinking when the numbers come in. And I think more than anything. I think the the bulk of the data that we're interested in is coming towards the end of the week rather than the beginning of the week. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't change the overall direction of travel for equity markets in general. And we can see that borne out here in terms of what equity markets are currently doing. We've got the FTSE 100, wasn't able to consolidate those gains above 7,000 slipped back quite sharply and we spent most of the last few days trying to claw those losses back um this this is this i think this is one of the things that we're going to have to get used to when it comes to um, uk stocks we get slow move higher a correction higher correction higher correction higher again so i would expect over the course of the next month for us to go above those previous highs head towards 7,200, 7,300. While we are above, first and foremost, 6,800, this trend line or support and resistance line here, but also this trend line from the lows back in February and the 50 day moving average. Ultimately, it's really about the overall trend. And for the moment, the overall trend continues to remain positive. Looking at the Germany 30 or the DAX, as we like to call it, that's stalled a bit over the course of the past week or so. And while the FTSE 100 looks as if it's probably going to finish this week higher, the DAX has found progress this month an awful lot more difficult. And it's not really hard to see why when you actually look at the fact that the DAX is, record, is at record highs, um, whereas um, indices like the CAC 40, which hit a 20 year high earlier this week, and the FTSE 100 aren't. So, and you also have to bear in mind that the DAX is a total return index. So, 
um, essentially it does it, it does give a slightly more distorted view of the overall market but if we what we can do or what we can tell from this particular chart here is if I draw a horizontal line through here I can see that there's a fairly decent area of support around about 15,000 so if we drop below 15,000 then you could argue that there is a little bit of a top starting to form here but while we're above that then the the upward bias still remains intact and even if we do break below that we've still got the 50-day moving average um, further down as well as obviously this trend line support all the way down through here but ultimately line of least resistance still shows for um, a move higher and the same can be said for the S&P 500 as well which has also continued to edge its way ever so slowly higher and we can certainly see that in terms of the weekly chart but also the monthly chart here um, it's gone almost parabolic let's get rid of this little line here because it serves no useful purpose really so just get rid of that move that back there and then redraw this line through here just attached to that low and attached to that low there and there we have it so so looking at the s p we're above 4200 a new record high and what was quite significant i've been talking about this in previous weeks was the nasdaq the nasdaq had been struggling to get back to its previous record highs and it has just about got back above them but it has been really painfully slow progress and if we look back at the record high on the 16th of april around about 14067 we only marginally got above that before drifting back down again and i think when you've got president biden articulating um, the case earlier this week for higher taxes um, in terms of the wealthiest Americans I don't think it's just wealthiest Americans he's got in mind it's also those big companies like Apple Amazon Facebook which essentially are printing profits on a quarter by quarter basis I mean taking Apple as a case in point this week um, they generated for their second quarter 89 billion dollars that's 40 billion dollars higher than the same quarter last year now you can argue that last year's um, earnings numbers were slightly depressed by the fact that we had we, we 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 were going through the first lockdown but apple's earnings have generally been fairly lockdown proof um, so while you could certainly make an argument for them being slightly depressed um, 40 billion difference from one quarter to the next particularly q2 to q2 that's a huge swing and um it's only just below um the previous record quarter of 91 billion dollars that we saw um or was projected for the previous pre-christmas earnings numbers which then smashed expectations and came in at 111 on the previous quarter so um be under no illusions i think the u.s government the democrats will be casting envious eyes at those numbers given the fact that both companies both not only did apple um, announce a buyback but so did alphabet alphabet 50 billion dollar buyback and apple a 90 billion dollar buyback and I would imagine that um, politicians would like to get their mitts on some of that money. Anyway, I'm digressing and I'm going on a little bit too long. Let's talk about what's coming up in the week ahead, because we can certainly we can clearly see that earnings um, this week have been fairly positive and we're going to have a particular close look at earnings in the coming week as well. Um, notable ones being British Airways, sorry, IAG international consolidated airlines intercontinental hotels group we've also got next um itv they're all they're all on here all the ones that we're, we're looking will be covering next week or i've written about um are, are are here so we've got uber peloton pfizer moderna 
intercontinental ice. I'm not going to cover them all in this video. You can see them in the news and analysis section on the CMC Markets um, uh, website. Um, where where I'll, where I'll cover them there. But let's start, I think, with non-farm payrolls. So what are we expecting? Well, certainly I think one of the things that I took away from Jay Powell's press conference earlier this week was that the 916,000 jobs that were added in March does not a recovery make. And I think what we're going to have to see is a consistent um, consistent month on month gain of around about 900,000 to a million jobs over the course of the next two to three months to really shift the Fed's focus when it comes to maybe preparing the market for a taper or a slight changing in monetary policy. If we look at the way payrolls have been over the course of the past few months since the since since January, we've seen job gains of 166,000, 468,000, and then 916,000. Now, general consensus is for something in the region of around about 900,000, there or thereabouts. And we've also got the ADP payrolls report as well on the Wednesday, which is expected to see another 825,000 on top of the 517,000 that we saw in March for ADP. What's notable about ADP though, is that it has lagged somewhat behind um, non-farm payrolls in terms of the number of new jobs added on a month on month basis. And maybe you'll get a little bit of a pick up there. What's also encouraging, I think, about um, the number estimates for non-farm payrolls for April is the fact that weekly jobless claims are now well below 600,000 and are trending around about 545, 550. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised that they're as high as that. Um, but if you actually look at the underemployment rate, that is still around about 10%. Um, whereas just before the, the pandemic, it was, a, it was an awful lot lower than that. So I, I still think there's still plenty of scope for people to come back into the workforce. And you can certainly see that borne out in the participation rate, which is around about 61.5%. Um, compared to 63.4 pre-pandemic. So there's an awful lot to get through in terms of the payrolls data, but ultimately the dollar has continued to sink back. But what's important, I think, in the overall scheme of things is that while we've slid lower over the course of the past month, we're still above the lows that we saw at the beginning of the year. And I think that maybe feeds into a narrative that could well be is that we're in a bit of a range trade um, and we're at the bottom of that range for the dollar with the risk that we could head back towards the the upside, particularly if the data next week is much better than expected. That should be positive relative to the data that we're going to be that, 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 that we're likely to get out of the euro area. I think people are pricing in the fact that the euro area is likely to start to recover. Well, I'm not totally convinced about that. And I certainly think that in opening up too early, Europe could actually find themselves back in lockdown very, very quickly unless they get their vaccination program really back on track. Looking at euro dollar, we broke out above this downward channel line here earlier this week, but we've struggled to really consolidate those gains. And there is a risk that this could potentially be a candlestick reversal pattern. If we fall back below 120.70, I've drawn it on here. If we fall back below 120.70, then we could drift back down again. I, th I was hoping to see a much more impulsive break higher here. We haven't seen that. And this peak at 121.50 should have really gone all the way back to here and it hasn't happened. So that does beg the question that we remain at risk of a move back down again, which in essence will drive the dollar higher. So I'm paying particular attention to 120.70 on euro dollar. If we slip back below that, then we could well see further losses. More importantly, I think the more important level though, is this level here around about 120 and a half. You've got that low there, 120.56, want that low there, which is around about the same sort of level. So if we drop back below 120 and a half, which is between the 50, 70 area on Euro dollar, we could well see this, the Euro dollar roll back down 
towards 119. Um, I can't get enthusiastic about euro dollar at these, at this, given that sort of structure within the price action, um, irrespective of what people are saying about euro dollar to 125. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet at all. And one of the reasons for that is this euro sterling chart still looks a little bit toppy, anywhere near 87.30, until such times as we break above 87.30. For me, euro sterling should go lower. We're also below um, some very key long-term moving averages. And while you could argue, yeah, well, it's making a base, it's making a base, that's as may be, but it needs confirmation. And until I get that confirmation, I'm very much of the opinion that this is a very much sell the rally market until such times as we get evidence to the contrary on that basis. So I'm paying particular attention to that in particular, the, the that, that uh, 87.30 area. So that brings me on to the PMIs, the Manufacturing and Services PMIs for April. Um, one of the bright spots amidst the gloom of the economic rebound has been the resilience of the manufacturing sector. And um, I don't think that is going to change. We've already seen from the flash numbers that they look very positive. The pressure points continue to remain in Spain and Italy. We saw, we've saw we seen that in the GDP numbers this morning, which you can see down here. Italy GDP slides 0.4%. Um, we had Spanish GDP coming in at minus 0.5%. Um, so again, you know, a double dip in Italy, and um, we just about avoided a double dip in, in, in Spain, but nonetheless, the Euro area did post a double dip recession. So we've seen a bit more resilience in the services sector, but Spain and Italy still remain below 50. They're still in contractionary territory, and there is a concern that that will continue to be the case, irrespective of what Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi is hoping to put together in terms of a recovery plan. So we've got the manufacturing PMIs, they're out on uh, out on the Wednesday, and um, the services PMIs are out on the Thursday. We've, all got, we've also got UK PMIs as well. They are likely to, or they're expected to be fairly solid. Um, services activity saw a big slump in January in the UK, but I think we've more than rebounded from that. We saw a big rebound of an 80 month high for services if the recent flash numbers are any guide. And I think this V-shaped recovery in services bodes well for the rest of Q2. And certainly in terms of the pound, um, there's been an awful lot of people who seem to think, um, rightly or wrongly, that um, the pound um, could find a little bit of a headwind when it comes to next week's elections, the Scottish parliamentary elections, and the risk of um, a vote for the SNP. I mean, not being fair, I cannot get excited about that at all. You know, the SNP won independence for Scotland. Well, yeah, that's not a surprise. And, it, you know, they'll always want another independence vote for Scotland. The big question is, will they be able to push one through? And if they do, um, will it be valid? For me, you know, any sort of vote for a referendum will be incredibly divisive, unless it's by a very clear margin. I think one thing that Brexit has taught us is that 52-48, um, 55-45 referendums are not the way to go, um, which means that even if the UK government allows um, the SNP to hold its referendum, I would imagine but they will insist that they need to get at least a 60% vote for it, um, because otherwise any other outcome is going to be incredibly divisive. And I think we've, we've seen plenty of division over the course of the past five years with the Brexit referendum. I don't think anyone wants to go through that again. Which brings me on to the Bank of England rate meeting, because I think as we get set for the third meeting of 2021, the economic picture is quite a bit different from where the bank was when it held its first meeting all the way back in February. At the time, in February, the bank would have had us believe that UK banks needed to prepare for the prospect of negative rates. Now, the work around that apparently is still going on, but things have changed quite a bit since then. And we've also heard that Andrew Haldane, um, Chief Economist of the Bank of England, 
is going to be departing in the summer. Um, and he's been one of the, I think he's been one of the key, he's been one of the key um, hawks. He's been, or not one of the key hawks, he's been, he's probably been one of the more hawkish members of the MPC in recent weeks because of his talk about a coiled spring rebound in the UK economy. And one thing that I did note from the UK banks numbers this week was the big build up that we saw in customer deposits and the big reduction that we saw in credit card spending and personal loan spending in terms of their overall numbers. Lloyds and NatWest both showed both showed big drops in credit card spending and, lo and personal loans and a big rise in customer deposits. Now that suggests to me that consumers are building up their cash buffers in preparation for the reopening in May and a potential significant rebound in Q2. So the Bank of England will be mindful of that. And if the data continues to move in the direction that it has been, and I'm surprised no one has mentioned this, even though that they're talking about this in the US, the potential for a withdrawal of accommodation, why would the Bank of England not consider um, cutting back on its bond buying program? That's a potential, you know, they cut, cut back on the amount of stimulus. That's a potential tightening of monetary policy. That should be supportive of sterling. You know, they don't have to raise rates. Why should they? They don't need to do that. But what they can do is cut back on the amount of stimulus. Um, and that would be a perfectly sensible thing to do, given the amount of accommodation that there is in the UK economy and given some concerns that have been raised that the Bank of England probably did a little bit too much stimulus. So it stands to reason maybe they start to taper that back a bit. So maybe get a little bit prepared for some limited taper talk um, at next week's Bank of England meeting. They'll want to manage the message very carefully because what they don't want to do is prompt to spike in gilt yields because they've stabilised around about current levels of around about 0.7, 0.75%. And they want to keep them there. They certainly won't want them to go up any higher. But there should be a way that the Bank of England can appear much, much more optimistic about the UK economy with its latest inflation report. And it's likely to also upgrade its growth forecasts as well. So keep an eye on the Bank of England. It's on the, on the Thursday, 6th of May. So we've done the manufacturing PMIs, we've got the services PMIs, those in particular I'll be paying particular attention to, the Bank of England rate meeting, non-farm payrolls. Ultimately, I would expect the pound looks looks fairly well supported above 138, look for a move back towards 140 and through 140.20. Obviously, the US dollar notwithstanding, if we look at the CMC sterling index, we can also see a little bit of a moderation there overall. It's been in a bit of a sideways channel. But again, here, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sideways consolidation, albeit a slightly downward one. But I would expect to see a little bit of a move towards the upside over the course of the next few days. There's nothing to be, I don't think there's really anything significant to be concerned about thus far. Got China trade, as I said earlier. Keep an eye on the exports and imports data. You've got to remember that also the comparatives there are likely to be um, are likely to be quite quite significant, given the fact that a year ago um, the Chinese economy was just coming out of lockdown. So the April numbers could well see a much larger year-on-year -year rebound in terms of exports and imports relative to a year ago. And you also got to bear in mind that these trade numbers could have been disrupted by the events in the Suez Canal. So there could have been a little bit of a, there could be a little bit of a skew there that we need to be aware of. Okay, so um, let's look at the numbers that are coming out this week. Let's start with International Consolidated Airlines Group, British Airways. They're always a fairly decent one. Um, now, in February, IAG reported a £6 billion loss. No one was surprised by that, given the impact in the travel sector over the last 12 months. I mean, in Q4 alone, the company posted a €1.47 billion Euro loss just in that quarter. So 
I don't think there are there will be any surprise is that the numbers that are due out this week are likely to be disappointing. The big question, I think, with respect to IAG is whether or not we get a return of transatlantic travel. Now, there has been talk of an air corridor being set up between the UK and the US so that US passengers can come over here as long as they've been vaccinated and vice versa. And you're going to get to hear an awful lot more about these so-called vaccine passports over the course of the past few weeks, I suspect. Um, for companies like IAG, they're going to be even more important given the fact they're making most of their revenue on their long haul routes, their, their transatlantic routes. So the sooner they can get those routes back up and running, albeit in some shape or form, I think the better. So it'll be interesting, I think, as we look towards these numbers, what the narrative is with respect to the with respect to the travel corridor because for the first quarter IAG estimated the capacity plans capacity plans for this quarter will be around 20% of 2019 levels so in essence Q1 is going to be worse than Q4 was and Q4 they lost 1.4 billion euros so the hope is that the loss won't be bigger than that what is notable from this particular chart if you look closely at it is that I look at that, there's a really good base at around about 178 and a half. So I would be surprised, no matter how bad the numbers are, if we drop below that, because then you shift the focus towards Q2 expectations. Now, IAG aren't going to offer any guidance. Why would they? The, tra the international travel outlook looks very uncertain. But overall, the hope is that there will be a recoverer, recoverer, recovery it'll just be a little bit later than perhaps markets are currently pricing in. But certainly in the context of this particular chart, we've got a decent area of support coming in around 178. So whatever the numbers are like, I will be paying particular attention to that. All right, moving on. Let's um, have a look at Intercontinental Hotels. Again, this is another this is another travel story. And again, we got a nice little trend line in place here. And one of the things that I noticed about Intercontinental was the fact that um, they've actually been more resilient than most. And I think that's simply because the China hotels have reopened, the Holiday Inns and what have you. And some of their US real estate has also actually been operating, albeit not at full capacity, but it's certainly been it's been it's been it's been working it's been um, operating fairly normally as normal as can be expected so um revenue per room is down around about 50 percent um but despite this they've still opened another 285 hotels over the course of the past 12 months so despite the difficult backdrop this they still they still appear to be doing something right and once again if you look at the charts here, you can see from this particular that there's a lovely line there from the lows all the way back from April 2020. Now, and this is why I love looking at charts, because they can give you an indication of the overall direction of travel uh, and where the money is going. And I that, that Intercontinental Hotels um, chart is, is quite, quite, quite a good indication of that. Next, PLC. Let's have a quick look at Next before we sign off, because um, I'm very cognizant of the fact that I've been rambling on for quite a bit. You wouldn't know from this chart that um, retail, UK retail, has been absolutely obliterated over the course of the past 12 months. Next is above its highs of last year. It's recovered really, really well. Um, they had already had a very good online operation leading into the pandemic. And while we did see a little bit of a sell-off initially and profits obviously dropped back quite sharply, um, the company by and large has remained fairly resilient when it comes to pulling back off the lows of last year. So just over a month ago, 
next race is full year guidance for this current fiscal year for pre-tax profits of 700 million pounds on the basis that online sales in February and March picked up the slack from the closure of retail stores. That was a trend that was borne out in the UK retail sales figures that we saw in March. And given the limited reopening that we've already started to see in April and we'll see in May, um, that is likely to feed in to a much better rebound going forward. So that's also going to be a factor in Boohoo's numbers when they come out also in the coming week, given the fact they've taken over all of the brands of Arcadia, Dorothy Perkins, Burton's and what have you. So retail is going to be a fairly big story next week as well. Boohoo.com, they've had a, what I would call a little bit of an up and down 12 months, given the problems at their Leicester factory. But nonetheless, we can see from this chart here um, the extent of those problems there. But nonetheless, we can see through here that there's a fairly decent base in and around just below 300. And even though we've tried to break above there, um, we haven't been able to do that. So that line's worth a little bit of a redraw. Let's just quickly do that now. One, two, three. And that comes in there. In fact, because that's on the through the peaks, I might actually draw that through there. Simply because. Now you can call that curve fitting or whatever you want to call it, but at the end of the day, um, there is a there, there is a clear direction of travel there. And if I change, if I change that chart to say, for example, a line chart, mid chart there. It works a little bit better that way, taking just taking the closing prices only to give you an indication of um, you need a close above that trend line to signal a nice little breakout. OK, so um, I think I think that's pretty much it for this week. If you want to catch up on all the other stuff that I've written about Uber, Peloton, Pfizer, Moderna, um, please go to the website. Otherwise, tune in for non-farm payrolls next Friday at 1 p.m. Um, otherwise, I will um, I will wind up this uh, particular webinar. Wish you all a nice long bank holiday weekend. Yes, it's a bank holiday, so we get an extra day off on Monday. Um, and I uh, hope you enjoy the weather and speak to you all the same time, same place next week. Thanks very much for listening.